coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Booth Babes. Reggie's Ready Body. A soft pretzel as the only vegetarian option. These are E3 memories. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with ya. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined as I am always joined by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. Mark, how's it going? It's going great. Patrick, I want to give you and all of our eager listeners yeah. an update on me drinking beet beets. Juice. Beets. I figured we were going to uh, revisit this at some point. I didn't know when. Frankly, I'm surprised it's happening so fast. <laughs> well, look, I think that there are a lot of doubters including myself, uh-huh. that I'd be able to keep this up. And I'm happy to say that I have been able to. Uh, beet juice does not get better with time. It does not taste better, but I have become more accustomed. To Mark, it, it's been like a week and a half. What I do know. you mean? <laughs> Here, here's the problem. Yeah. It, it, the problem is that it feels like an accomplishment mm-hmm. that I've been able to do it for a week and a half. And presumably, I should be doing this for, like, the rest of my life. Okay, so how much beet juice are you drinking? Here's the thing. It's not even that much. It's, okay. like, eight ounces. I mean, a, of just straight beet juice? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, that's not juice. nothing. That, I mean, that's, that's a, that's, you're drinking beet juice there, buddy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, have, I'm, I'm having smoothies mm-hmm. with uh, a beet in them uh, and either spinach or kale, sometimes both. Uh, like almond butter, like ground flax seed. Like I think we just have, have be- uh, entered boring parts of our lives. I Mark. think I think so too. Um, but and I I think that's fine. Sure. Okay. I'm yeah. fine with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have determined that I am fine with it. Um, Mark, I would like to congratulate you for not uh asking me about the band aid that's on my ear. <laughs> Because, Mark, let me tell you something about the Band-Aid on my ear. I just assumed you got your ear pierced. No. <laughs> no, what happened was I was uh, shaving my face uh-huh. in the shower. And I was like, I've got some kind of like fuzzy ear lobe thing oh, happening no. here. And so I went up to shave my ear and I cut myself. I cut my ear and it bled a lot. I took like a little chunk out of my ear. Oh, whoa. Yeah. Well, let me... A little chunk. A little one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let me use this opportunity to say you would look great with an earring. Thank you, Mark. I, it's not. It's not something that will ever enter my. My um, uncle used to like torture me with the threat of taking me to the mall to get my ears pierced. Uh-huh. I don't know why he did that. Probably because he was a homophobic weirdo, and I didn't like him. Um, but like, it used to. He used to freak me out. Um, uh, and like, I remember being young and like negotiating him down to clip on earrings. <laughs> None of it was really going to happen, I'm sure. So this is a less scary story than it sounds. But, like, it felt real. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, look, clip-on earrings, if you just want to try out the earring. Right. Like, I think the clip-on earring would be a great way to do it. Just clip one on, you know, go get yourself a beer, see how the world is, you know, feeling about it. Right. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've tried a clip-on earring before. Mark, here's something we need, we need to, we, we, we're talking about our E3 memories today so we don't look as much as i love uh beat talk and uncle trauma um i think we need to move on to introducing the sonic forces borrowing program um if people want to borrow my copy of sonic forces they can or they can certainly try all they gotta do is email us at nintendo cartridge society at gmail.com and give us a mailing address so we can send my copy of that game to there may be a copy of untitled goose game inside sonic forces instead of sonic forces there's nothing we can do about that it's just part of the program now uh it's still perfect um, so no need to worry about that. Another thing you can do is leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, I think that uh, we have another five-star review coming <gasps> on Apple Podcasts. Coming? We'll see. What happens is that, uh, or what I've noticed tends to happen, is uh, I'm checking and it's like, oh, our count went from like uh, 128 to 129. 
but the written review isn't there yet because that oh. sometimes takes a couple of days. Or maybe they didn't leave a written review and they just like gave us five stars. Now that is interesting. But it's possible mm-hmm. that uh, we'll have another one, another person to shout out soon. And if you want to be on that list, you can just uh, leave us a five star review wherever you get your podcast. If it's not Apple Podcasts in the US, feel free to shoot us an email or hit us up on Twitter and we would love to shout you out on the show. Yeah. Um, uh, I also like maybe the idea that you are secreting it into the universe right now, that you're just like, oh, yes, we have another one coming. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I said I why. It. Um, please get your reviews in. Mark, um, we, here we are uh, on the eve of E3, s- sort of. <laughs> Actually, no, by the time this comes out, like, we're, we're, we're there, right? We're we certainly are, on the cusp. We are certainly on the cusp of the eve of E3. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we decided that we would go back in time. Mark, let's talk about our favorite E3 memories. Oh, I do. I cue the music live now. Mark, let's talk about our favorite E3 memories. I will get used to it. Well, again, one of these days, I will get used to it. Well, it doesn't help that we like have been alternating how we produce the show this is a great point um we are in person mark so and and i wanted to address like uh the i feel like there's a big elephant in the room of like e3 memories Mm -hmm. where it's like truly my favorite e3 memories are being at the show yeah right like uh walking around that show floor with you walking around that show floor with uh uh, Christian Humes who's been on the show before uh, walking around with uh, Chris Bermonte you know like what being on the show floor and like experiencing it with people obviously would just be the top five memories uh, like easy right I would just pick five different moments um, so I just wanted to I wanted to say that up front that just because I'm not going to be calling out like every sandwich we ate together like that was I probably enjoyed that more than whatever announcement well I, I was wondering when did you become cognizant of E3 as like Oh, what a great thing? question. Yeah. Because I think for me, it really wasn't until like 2004. The one I really remember is um, reading about. Because in 2004, maybe the show was available on like G4 Network or something, which uh, I don't think exists anymore. And if it does, definitely not in the It's form existing that it... again. Oh, okay. Yeah. But basically G4 Network was... Uh, television network, a cable television network that was all about um, like tech and video games and that kind of stuff. And so they at some point were like live streaming E3 presentations. And I think by 2004 they had started, but that is not how like I learned about E3 or really was like became aware of it. It was 2004 was um, like the Nintendo DS presentation from yeah. Nintendo. And so I remember reading in like Nintendo Power and like Electronic Gaming Monthly. And that, that's the first time I really remember being uh, aware of E3 as, like, a thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, gosh, uh, I, I think I was aware of it as a thing probably uh, around that same time, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, but, yeah, it really wasn't until, like, you could start to, and, God, I, I remember when, like, you weren't watching conferences streaming, but someone would put up a video after it was over, because this is, you know, that that was the technology that was available to us. You can't possibly stream video to uh, live viewers everywhere in the world, uh, whereas now you certainly can. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of like what would have been. It's it's a certainly a more recent phenomenon than like I care to admit, right? That like uh, treating it like a holiday where you're going to be plugged into like watching stuff um, like the the whole time. Um, but yeah, I guess it has probably been like 15 years, probably of, yeah. of doing this. But that. It- but most of my like favorite memories of E3 are from recent. Yeah, E3s. me too. Me too. I've I've got one that goes back pretty far. Um, but yeah, for for the most part, my all of the memories that I have listed here are from like the last like five ish years. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I have five memories here. Mark, do you have five memories as well? Yes. Okay. Um. Would you like to go first, or should I? Uh, you can go ahead and go first. Okay. Um. So I have for my first uh if my favorite e3 memory um is nintendo's direct from 2013 um which is a year that showed complete wii u dominance only in hindsight um because the wii look 
we can say anything we want to about the the Wii U. It uh, you know lived a, a short life, um, had a, a couple of really good games on it that would later be ported to the Switch, um, and you know never really found like a, an audience. Had this big weird uh, tablet controller, um, and just like you know sales wise didn't work. During this Nintendo Direct, I just want to run down the, the the bullet points here, and we should not be able to brush any of these away because they are games that we now play on the Switch. This is the E3 dominance from the Nintendo Direct in uh, 2013. Super Mario 3D World, Revealed, came out that November. Mario Kart 8, Revealed, came out the next spring. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, Revealed, and then due out in November, but it was delayed until February. Xenoblade Chronicles X, Revealed, didn't come out for the next two years. Uh, then they also featured The Legend of Zelda, Wind Waker HD, The Wonderful 101, Bayonetta 2, a Wii U Party and Wii Fit U and Super Smash Brothers for Wii U, which was dated for the first time oh my in this gosh. presentation. This, I mean, it's Smash. It's Mario Kart. It's a new Mario game. It's a new Donkey Kong game. It's the kind of stuff that if we saw it on this coming E3, our minds would be blown. That is a, that's a stacked lineup. It's a stacked lineup on a failed and failing <laughs> system. Like it's it is a, it was a mind blowing thing to because you know I kind of started this by being like oh, I'm just gonna like click around and see what I can yeah. uh, find and refresh my memory of these presentations. Um and like the the things that they were showing for the Wii U. There's no I mean there is a reason and I know what the reason is. It's that it has a big weird tablet and it's called a Wii. Um still um this, the marketing was all wrong on it. But like all of this software seems killer yeah so i mean they are they like you were saying these are all killer games yeah that have now found like a huge audience uh on the switch i guess except for you know played chronicles x right um and specifically the wind waker hd but wonderful 101 bayonetta 2 um smash brothers there's a version of it uh super mario 3d world mario kart 8 and donkey kong country tropical freeze are all literally on the system yeah and are part of like the, the pillars that we hold up is like oh well the switch is so great because it has right <laughs> you know uh what i remember from that e3 is when tropical freeze was announced a small but vocal contingent being really upset for some reason <laughs> <laughs> I, and i honestly i don't know that i can articulate why they were upset, I think it was just that, like... It's got to be Metroid-related, right? Like, probably. I'll, that it's, like, I'll retro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I bet you that uh, Retro Games was working on another Donkey Kong instead of working on something, like, Metroid-related. But, uh... I mean, especially if you, uh, keep, like, bring the knowledge of the, the last game, the, the last Donkey Kong game they made was fine, but, like, Returns has its problems, right? Right. Um, and the level design is, isn't as great as Tropical Freeze eventually, uh, like, proved that they, they could do. Um, and there's just so much like motion control, like gimmick stuff. Like, I don't think people were ready for Tropical Freeze to be a banger. And even when it came out, I don't think anyone recognized it as a banger. Like, it's it's a game that we look back on fondly um, now and, you know, we're hyped for when it was re-released on Switch. But it, it didn't release that fanfare originally. That's so that's so interesting that that 2013 E3 was so huge. I think for whatever reason at that and. I, at that time, like I was kind of checked out from video games yes. in that period. And so I don't even think I watched like the presentations that year. Yeah. I mean, I might not have either. I th it, Mario Kart 8 was the thing that I was like, okay, that's it. That's, that's the trigger for me. Now I'm going to get um, the, the Wii U. You remember like we were, uh, we were like new friends at that point. Yeah. Um, and like, I, I remember there being a day when I said to you and our friend Chuck, like, I think I'm going to try to get a Wii U. Like, and like it being a thing, you're like, okay, all right, yeah, sure. I, I could see that for you. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do remember. And I remember going to your house and yeah. playing Mario Kart yeah. when you had it. Yeah. And I feel like you were at that time, you were, play, you were playing your like Vita more than you were playing anything yeah, else. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Man, weird times. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, my first memory is from E3 2015. And um, this was the first year that I was able to go to E3. I was taking a musical improv class. Um, and there was a, a great guy named Charles in that class. And he worked for Activision Blizzard. And so this was back before E3 like opened up to everybody. And so you had to be like press or you had to be industry. And he like uh, was able to get me and you were saying our friend Chuck a badge to go in 2015. And uh, the Nintendo 
like big releases that year, the things they were promoting were Super Mario Maker. Um, and but the most memorable part for me yeah. is we waited in line to play a the demo for Star Fox Zero. And I I don't even know if it was called Star Fox Zero at that point. It, might it was. Like it was. Fox. Yeah. I, I watched that whole presentation earlier today because I was like, do I want to count this puppet thing? Um, the the presentation started with uh, Miyamoto and uh, Iwata and Reggie as puppets. That's right. That's yeah. right. And it led into Star Fox Zero and they, they were calling it that at the time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we were waiting in line for the demo station for Star Fox Zero. And while you were waiting... There were uh, these Nintendo like booth employees, um, all women, all with 3DSs tethered to them, just like walking around and uh, offering to let you play the demo for Yokai Watch. Because the first one was being localized oh uh, in the US. And so I remember playing the demo for Yokai Watch while this woman stood like five feet away from yeah, me. Yeah, the tether's just so awkward, short. Aw- yeah. Awkwardly for like, 12 minutes while I play this game it's so while well, Chuck like makes like awkward small talk with her because you can't ignore the presence of a person no. who's like standing that close to you you cannot it's such it was such an awkward like funny interaction that that is that is like my strongest memory from uh from E3 that year um that's great I actually have a memory that is very similar to that but without maybe the, the awkward bent um, so I'm just going to j- jump into it. Uh, this is from uh, E3 2019, a.k.a. the last E3 that uh, will ever happen in person. I don't know if that's true. Um, but Mark and I were both in attendance, um, and uh, you know, b- big games on, on the show floor uh, this year were uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, which Mark and I had made an appointment to, uh, to go see. Um, but we were also like, uh, we wanted to see Link's Awakening, right? Um, because the the Link's Awakening uh, uh, remake had been uh, not revealed, but it was like the first kind of like deep dive during uh, the the direct, and so we were uh, standing in line for this thing. And it was a super long line um, in the weirdest uh, the weirdest like conference room hall you could imagine, because this is normally the hall that's taken up by Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony, right? Um, and Microsoft and Sony, no presence on the show floor. So it was just like Nintendo and then like, I don't know, Monster Energy Drink had like a, <laughs> a, a meditation booth or something. Um, it doesn't seem right. But it was, it was something equally nonsensical, right? Um, and so we're like, okay, well, let, let's play uh, Link's Awakening. Um, we had already gotten our time in with um, Luigi's Mansion and uh, Pokemon um, Sword and Shield, uh, which all had like these cool uh, like stations where they had set up like these whole immersive experiences. Um, but they didn't. They had so few demo stations for Link's Awakening. They had severely underestimated the uh, public's desire to play this game, or the, the press, yeah. or whoever was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you and I stood in a super long line, just watching the time get closer and closer to our Final Fantasy VII remake appointment. Um, and uh, we're like, uh, okay, well, if, if we get in in the next like batch, then we can probably make it if we run. Right. And like it just getting like closer and closer and like feeling stressed out about it. But also they had, well, they didn't have like a, a whole like biome set up for Link's Awakening. They did have these awesome dioramas that looked 100% like the gameplay of the Link's Awakening remake. Um, and it was just this like magical, cool thing. And they gave you these uh, little Link uh, keychains, which I still have and I still love. Um, and we got to play that game, which is a remake of one of my favorite games uh, of all time. Um, and uh, we, the power went out while we were waiting. <laughs> for, do you remember right. this? I forgot about um, that. So like we we I, we were both like a little stressed out, sort of in a panic, also like under the spell of this diorama. The power goes out, and we played the game, had fun, made it to the Final Fantasy VII Remake demo. It was perfect. No, I totally... Uh, 20, E3 2019 is also one of the memories I've written down. Uh, I had so much fun at that show, hanging out with you, hanging out with friend of the show, June, in front of the show, Michael, um, and then Matt uh, yep. uh, Acevedo was there, and um, Christian, like you mentioned. It was just... It was so much fun. Uh, the part I remember about waiting for Link's Awakening is the Treehouse Live was on like the second floor of the yes. Nintendo booth. And so we we saw like Aonuma oh, we like, did. up there. We um, so did. <laughs> we so, uh, and then I remember I felt like Liz Lemon on the Sandwich Day episode of 30 Rock when she's like 
trying to go to the airport. I can have it all. <laughs> that's totally how I felt when we were we were waiting in line for Link's Awakening. It was like, are we going to be able to squeeze, like, do this and go yeah. to, like, um, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake? And we were like, okay, let's just, we, we'll just stay in line. We can play Link's Awakening. We can do it. We can have it all, and we were able to. It was a, it was a great year. Yeah, and we I, I wouldn't say that we actually ran, because we had to go from one hall to the other hall. Um, and I wouldn't say that we actually ran, but we did, we like... We power walked. Look, we, like, long-legged, <laughs> well, you know, city walked through. Uh, <laughs> it was good. It was the, good. We made it. The other it, thing uh, I remember really strongly about that year was uh, we waited in line to play Luigi's Mansion. Yeah. And... Um, we got in, and the Luigi's Mansion booth was pretty cool. It was like, um, it was enclosed, and it was they used dark lights, and it was uh, or black lights, and it was all kind of like, like kind of like a, a dark ride at a theme park, um, except without like the ride part. But they had set it up to be like a spooky hotel. Yeah, and uh, the the people running the booth were all wearing um, like bright pink bellboy like bellhop outfits. They were so good looking yeah like the, oh my gosh the yeah. outfits i mean we're, the outfits. we're perfect yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and, loved them and uh so i remember getting to the demo station and i for whatever didn't reason, you die really I died early? <laughs> like in 30 seconds and i didn't know what to do and the lady didn't know what to do and so i was just like yeah i, I just excused myself basically <laughs> it was so humiliating <laughs> how do you die in like the first 30 seconds of luigi's mansion demo I managed to do it. <laughs> was it uh, more humiliating or less humiliating than when we were playing uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield? And there's a uh, a woman over my shoulder being like, "Do you know about types?" <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> oh, this whole experience is awful. It just goes to show how terrible I am at like the small talk interactions yes. at places like that, where it's just like. I know that your job is to engage me, yes. but I do not want to be having this interaction. No, not at all. <laughs> um, okay, well, that was a big ball of memories. Uh, is it back to me, or do you, do you have a... Uh, I, uh, I'm counting that as one of my memories, okay, okay. so it is, I, it is back to you. Okay, back to me. Um, so, for this one, I'm going to go off the Nintendo uh, uh, range here, um, and specifically to a, Ninten- or to a, a Sony presentation. Um, the last Sony presentation that they had at E3 uh, in 2018, um, which was a weird year for them anyway. Like, it seemed like they were already sort of half out the door. Um, and, you know, they didn't come back in 2019. Obviously, they're not uh, participating this year. Um, and I am referring to their Last of Us Part Two uh, presentation. It was the gameplay reveal for The Last of Us Part Two, um, And they did... It was so weird. They put... Uh, they put the people that were attending the conference in like a different venue from where they were going to be holding the rest of it. And it was all like uh, decked out like lights for the barn dance in uh, The Last of Us Part Two. Um, and there was a musician on stage like playing guitar. And then they played this trailer. And the trailer is, um, you know, very Naughty Dog, very like cinematic, um, like Ellie hanging out at this um, barn dance. And eventually dancing with Dina and like they have this and it's it's all very like low stakes drama stuff where it's like just between these two characters. Um, and uh, then they share a kiss and the camera kind of like uh, warps around their head. And then it's like eight minutes of late in the game Ellie gameplay, which is like brutal and violent and just like all of the like edgy things you think about when you think of The Last of Us. Um, and then, uh, you know, it ends with her, her, like, choking a guy out, and the camera, again, like, warping around her head and getting, like, the end of that kiss, um, and so <clears throat> it's just, like, the perfect summation of what those games can be when they're doing it right, of, like, here's the super, like, human side of it, the, like, kind of messy, sort of gross, but also, like, small stake stuff, and then also this, like, hyper-violent, um, and, you know, the the game is so, like, divisive and um like you just feel so much about the, like it's hard not to have a strong reaction to the game um and i feel like that trailer um achieves the same kind of art and the same like magnitude of art um that the game eventually would when it came out like two years later wow yeah that that's really that's really interesting i i've never i haven't played the last of us part two um but i do remember when that trailer came out yeah and even the trailer was pretty like divisive 
Yeah, well, so it, it was. It, it's it's not the f- the first trailer where like they're breaking someone's uh, arms, like right, the right. Hyper violent. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like it is still, uh, you know, like crazy hyper violent, but they're showing that in the gameplay and not in like the story. And I mean, I remember being sort of divided on, uh, like in myself at the time because I really liked the first game, right? Um, and uh, you know, Neil Druckmann, the uh, director, had, had uh, said that the first game was about love, the second game was about hate. Um, and you know, I don't like just as fundamentally as like someone who takes in art, um, I don't really want to spend too much time in hate. Um, and, uh, the game does spend a lot of time there, but it also is like, here's the cost of hate, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, it's a, a, a game that I ended up, uh, like deeply loving. Um, and it's, it's amazing to look back on that trailer, um, even now three years later and be like, wow, like they, they had all of this here and also the the barn dance sequence is like penultimate cutscene in the game like it's it's wild that they showed so much oh, of wow basically the ending of the game um obviously a divorce of context and like you don't really know what it what it means um but it was a it was a cool thing to get to in the gameplay and be like oh and just sort of experience your whole ride with the game uh like retroactively right then i don't know it was, it's 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 a it's a great piece of art and I thought it was really really cool like a top like a 10 out of 10 hype moment. Wow, me. that's yeah. really cool. Were you were you saying that like when they revealed it they had like it was a, like an offsite type thing and they had created the room to be like where the barn dance was? Yeah. And they had it's you know the thing the kind of thing where they have uh uh like the hanging lights where it's just like a cord with like exposed mm-hmm. like Edison bulbs. Yeah. Um and like that is also reflected in uh the the trailer. Um, and the guy playing music is, you know, playing like sort of slack key guitar. Um, so it sounds like the music of the last of us, which also, um, like kind of morphs into the music that's being played at the barn dance. Um, so it, I don't know. It was just like so holistic. And so like, you know, it, it, it meant that the rest of their presentation was slowed way down because after that trailer, they moved people like to uh, uh-huh. a regular theater site to like see the rest of it. Um, so as an observer watching these things at home was like, what is going on? Um, but I mean, just looking back on it, I'm like, oh yeah, they made like absolutely theatrically the best choice. Well, and it's so interesting because I do think that's something that uh, I will miss from E3 because even when the I I love spectacle, I love spectacle. Spectacle's great. And so e- even I, I think that is definitely missing from the um, online presentations. Like I think Nintendo Directs can be fun, but there is something to like the spectacle of it all, even the bad spectacle, like the years yeah. that like, uh, I think like Microsoft engaged Cirque du Soleil, you know, for like whatever reason. Yeah. Um, just like all, all of that is so much part of E3 that I am a little sad if like that goes away. Yeah. Because the awkward presentations and like the enormous scale of it all was definitely, is definitely something that is like, Art of E3 in my memory. Totally. And it's just, it's just interesting that, like, because you do see a lot of, you know, you brought up Microsoft, but, like, you know, bringing out uh, Keanu Reeves on stage, stage totally. to talk about cyberpunk or, um, you know, Microsoft, maybe last or two years ago or three, they had, like, all of these Xboxes on stage and, like, a thing, like, a drawer that pulled out with, like, people in it. You know, like, the, there's some, like, really gross, huge spectacle. And it's just cool to see that like applied to something as like artful as The Last of Us, where it's like, okay, we're gonna leverage all of the production power of uh, uh, Naughty Dog and uh, Sony to make it feel like we're at a barn dance, you know? Like, mm-hmm. um, it's just so cool, and yeah, I'm I'm sad that that necessarily won't be a part of what we experience this year. Uh, my next E3 memory is from E3 2018, and I would say that this, as far as like Nintendo's presentation overall, is um probably is like polarizing in the sense that they devoted a ton of it, the vast majority of it to uh, super smash brothers ultimate. Yeah. Um, and this was like, we, we didn't know that it was called ultimate before the presentation. Like the game was coming out that December. Like this was the big blowout. We had had the teaser a few months before, but this was when Sakurai was like, Hey, it's called super smash Brothers ultimate. Let me lay it all out for you. But the moment that is like, Oh yeah. Ingrained yes. in my memory. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> is uh when they start showing the tra- a trailer with all of the different characters that will be in the game. 
Right. And it, it, at this point, it's like, okay, we're getting a, a lot of the same characters yeah. that we uh, had seen uh, in uh, Smash Brothers for uh, Wii U and 3DS. Yep. Yep. And there were, and there was kind of coming faster and faster. They're coming faster and faster. And so you're like, okay, all right. Like these are all characters I kind of like expect that. uh, And then, well, cause uh, uh, just before you get to this, there was also uh, the, the open question of like, Oh, is it just sort of like a port, like an, an up res port? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah. the Smash 4. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there was a lot of that around lingering around games uh, for the switch, right? Like, when Splatoon 2 was first shown off just in teaser form, people were like, oh, is this just like Split, like with Mario Kart 8, is it kind yeah. of like Splatoon again? Right. Are um, we just going to get Super Smash Brothers Deluxe? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so they're showing off all these different characters. It's Coming like, faster oh, cool. and faster and faster. It. But like, and then Solid Snake shows up. Uh huh. And then on the screen, it says, <laughs> everyone <laughs> is. Here. God, it was so great. And then it was like, here's Pichu, here's Young Link, here's uh, just like, all these characters that have been like dead and buried because they were redundant to some other form of whatever. And just like, <laughs> no, oh, everyone is here. Everyone is back. And if you, I recommend to everybody on YouTube, you can find um, the live like crowd reaction for the people who are gathered at the N- Nintendo store in uh, New York, yeah. in New York City. And when Snake shows up and it says, everyone is here, that place loses its mind. And every reveal just yeah. gets like the biggest, most hyped reaction. It's so much fun. That was such a fun reveal that like literally <laughs> yeah. every character ever, the ones you thought that were never coming back were in this They game. were there. I was at E3 while that, uh, while that presentation was happening. I was in the press lounge. Um, hanging out with the uh unranked podcast guys. Um, and uh, you know everyone, cause like you know you, the the show floor opens like basically the second the presentation is over, and everyone in the room wants to watch the presentation, but it's not like up on a screen or anything. So everyone is like plugged into their phones or their computers and are streaming it. Um, but just because you know you're, everyone's streaming to separate devices, it's not happening at the exact same time. So it was crazy to see this like rolling reaction of people being like oh <laughs> but yeah a- everyone is here is a, like an all-time uh a- amazing moment it was so good it was it was so much fun oh man uh mark that's such a good one uh i'm gonna take us back to 2015 um which i believe you you already mentioned um but mine is not a uh a uh, at the event uh at the conference center uh, memory, but is rather a memory from the Nintendo Direct from that year. And you previously mentioned that it was about uh, Star Fox Zero mostly, but then also Super Mario Maker. Um, and Super Mario Maker, the first one, obviously a huge deal, a game that I uh, lo- loved a bunch. Um, but the thing that was so cool about the way they announced it is they just like sat in it with like uh, Miyamoto and another uh, developer who had you know been with Nintendo forever, um, and they're like unearthing these. Um, paper documents that show like level designs for the original super mario brothers and it's on graph paper and they're like so you know if we had to make changes uh you know that we had and they you could see like white out on the paper uh, and then they like flipped over some transparency paper like over it where they're like so then you know it's like crossed off here and like a couple blocks added here um and just seeing all these pieces of like very early Nintendo art that would be used to make the game, right? It's not concept art. Like this is what they gave to the programmers and were like, make that the level. Um, it's it's something that like, I wish they would do now. I wish they would still do where they're like, oh yeah, here's us digging through our history. Um, you know, we got like uh, the Fire Emblem, the, the original um, re-released on, on Switch last year. Um, and... Well, yeah, the special edition of it came with like an art book with all this like look through the history. Would have been cool to have that as part of like a video presentation, right? Yeah, Nintendo is a really interesting company in the sense that they will obviously like their past is such a huge part of uh like yeah. why we love Nintendo and they continue to like bring things back from their past, but they're also like very still very secretive. Yes, and there are so many of those like documents or that sort of thing that would be so cool for them to share, even in just like a video presentation. Um, so we could just like get a glimpse of it because 
uh you had like it's so foundational for a lot of people's like video game fandom totally um that it feels a little bit sad that it is just like in a warehouse somewhere in kyoto yeah and not like uh really documented anywhere for people to appreciate yeah and you know they they do surface stuff from time to time but like that that was one of those uh where it felt like especially like open or vulnerable or something i don't know um and just having like miyamoto there like yeah, that pulling out so those, it's crazy. so neat yeah um you know we uh last year we went through old um like console reveal presentations um and you know those are all like interesting little time capsules for you know whatever reason um but like this is a chunk of the direct that is like just the the value is apparent and like divorced from time right like um it doesn't feel uh like nostalgic to 2015 it feels like nostalgic to 1987 you know um it just it's just an impossibly cool thing that they captured uh with Miyamoto like talking through what it was like to make games 30 years ago God, that's so that's so cool that's so cool um i'm also going to go back a little bit this is the furthest back that my uh uh that i have a memory to talk about today and that is from E3 2004 um this is a really like fun one it's the first one that Reggie and we might have talked about it in uh last year when we did our like flashback this to is different E3 presentation during the DS reveal because this was the yeah. DS reveal this was Reggie's uh Reggie Fizeme former president of Nintendo of America this was his first presentation i believe oh yeah and oh, that's um, right and so, and they were showing off the DS for the first time, right? So this was a Nintendo that had something or felt like they had something to prove. Yeah. And um, it is really fun to go back and just like revisit the Nintendo DS reveal because it, 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 it encapsulated what makes like E3 so special, like these old E3 presentations. And as much as I love the N Nintendo Directs, and as much as I think that they like improve the experience because there's none of the awkward like transitions or anything. Right. There was something really unique about uh, these early E3 presentations where it's this audience of like hyper fans, even though they're like press and industry, like everybody is like, yeah. you know, like everybody's so invested and like hyped on like whatever the next big thing is. And so the reveal for the Nintendo DS is so fun to watch because Reggie is like showing it, he's talking about it and he's like, running this brand new Metroid game, which turns out to be Metroid Hunters. Right. The audience loses its mind. And then he's like, that you'll all be playing tomorrow. The audience at this point is just like tearing their clothes right, off. Right, they right, Cannot deal with it. Rolling around in the aisles. <laughs> and then he's like, uh, there's two media ports, one for the DS games and one for the GBA cart. And everybody's like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> like, it just keeps building. And then yeah. he's like, there's two new ways to control the Nintendo DS. The touchscreen and then voice controls. He pauses for the big reaction. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but then the very next one, he's like, and it has Wi-Fi. And again, the audience yeah, just like explodes. dies. Um, it's so much fun. Everybody's like hooting and hollering. And then at the very end of the presentation, um, this is prob maybe peak E3 ever. Uh, at the end of the presentation, they're like, we have one more thing to show you for the GameCube. They start this trailer, and it is the first trailer for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, at this point just called Legend of Zelda. Twilight Princess isn't the subtitle yet, or they haven't revealed it yet. And then at the end, and it's the context for the Twilight Princess trailer is previously, you know, the previous game, Zelda game, was Wind Waker which now I feel like has a very stellar reputation, but the time was not what people, what a lot of people wanted. A lot of people coming off of Ocarina of Time and Majora's yeah. Mask. Well, not, uh, not a lot of what we thought or that fans thought they were promised. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. They were, you know, coming off of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, the expectation is that they'd be getting this, like, really realistic, adult, for lack of a better term, yeah. um, like Legend of Zelda. And so when Wind Waker was revealed and it was had this very, like, cel-shaded cartoony, it was just, it, there were people who were disappointed in that. And so there was this, uh, so for Nintendo to seemingly be deliver, be delivering on that promise in this Legend of Zelda game, um, people were lost their minds. And then 
the like set opens up. There's a bunch of smoke, and Shigeru Miyamoto is holding uh, Link's shield and sword, right? And comes out on stage and is like tw- swinging it around, yep. making all these poses. And people, it is like people love it. It is like the Beatles at Shell Stadium. Like it is, yeah. it is pandemonium in that room. That's so good. Doesn't he come out to like the uh, Conan the Barbarian music or something? I don't, like that? I don't remember. It's incredible. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that that is also, and I know like Nintendo still has like a lot of these uh, personalities, but you know, um, Awada passed a couple years ago, and Reggie no longer works uh, for the company. Um, so just like knowing that, uh, you know, some of the Titans uh, aren't uh, acting as like the face of the company anymore. I mean, even Miyamoto's role has changed dramatically. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, he's also just like gotten older too. Like, mm-hmm. uh, and there there are new faces. Like Koizumi is, uh, you know, a lot more front and center. Um, Alnuma will always be um, uh, out there. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I I just you know when, when going back through these and uh, seeing the the puppet intro for. Uh, with Iwata, Miyamoto, and Reggie, where it's just like, yeah, those are like the triumvirate of mm-hmm. uh, Nintendo. Like, and I just don't know that they have that right now. Um, the people that you expect to see, that you want to see, shepherd you through all of this. Um, but that's a good one, Mark. That's such a good memory. I like it a lot. Um, my final E3 memory is also my oldest E3 memory uh, that made this list, um, and it is the E3 20 or uh, 2009. Super Mario Galaxy 2 reveal trailer um, for a couple different reasons, uh, but sort of principally among them is I loved Super Mario Galaxy. Um, was a game, you know, like was for me sort of like the second life of the Wii, right? Like the Wii had its, um, you know, Wii Sports, its Wario, WarioWare Smooth Moves uh, and like all of that, like couch co-op stuff had that era and i experienced that in two different places that i lived and then i moved to chicago and super mario galaxy the original was when i was like oh i can play like a game on this thing i can play like an old-fashioned uh 3d mario game that blows my mind and is incredible um and you know how nintendo is with uh mario games they make it and then they move on to something else not true with super mario galaxy they just had so many like ideas that weren't implemented in the first one uh, and the trailer which is like two minutes long um shows off just an embarrassment of riches there's so many like new power-ups you see yoshi um you see like big boss battles um and just like the sheer variety of like uh, not gimmicky but like unique special things that they show off in that trailer is just astounding beyond all of that there's the music for this trailer which is out of control good. Um, so you know the the like main Mario Galaxy theme, the bum 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 bum. It usually has this little like ostinato pattern under it, this like dun 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 dun. Um, that sort of like drives it forward. Um, and in the first half of this trailer, like it has that, and in the second half, the ostinato drops out, and it's just like these big, uh, bassy strings that just like rise with each measure. Um, I have it here. Can we listen to a little bit of Please, it? Please, I would love to. Um, so uh, I'm going to play the, the, the first part. You'll hear like the, the ostinato and all that. And also, sorry, there are um, like sound effects and stuff in here, but um, here's, here's how it sounds in the beginning. You can hear like the strings like hitting those dun dun, which is cool and makes it like feel propulsive, pr- propulsive and and like has real energy to it. Later, when they drop it out here, I'm gonna skip us forward to where where they drop it out and it just goes uh, to these rising bass strings, which is so like I lose my mind. It's so pretty. Um, here we go.
it's another moment where just like the art of the trailer is uh just a sublime piece of media <laughs> so good <laughs> like I, I just don't i just don't understand it uh, check out the trailer if you haven't seen it in a long time uh, it shows uh, off some really cool stuff and it's better to hear that music without me interrupting it and talking over it and whatnot um but you're right like super mario galaxy 2 being revealed was so cool because we had gotten used to the idea that it was like you're basically getting one nin- yeah. mario game a generation um and so it was like okay like we had galaxy galaxy was awesome and so then to get galaxy 2 like a direct sequel it was just so crazy it was so crazy and that game is so amazing yeah and yeah yeah it's just it's just incredible and it's it's one of those things where you just like feel lucky to be a nintendo fan and a mario fan um so yeah that that's one of my all-time favorite uh e3 memories so my last well before we get to my last memory i just want like talking about all of this you know on tuesday's Mm, show very good and previous to that you know we had been kind of like almost jokingly but also kind of sincerely being like i think like e3 is basically dead um and talking about this like it kind of makes me sad because when e3 is good yes it's like it's there's it's unmatched as far as i'm concerned in like um uh media reveals like you know like this sort of thing totally and you know there are some years that are like lower years than others but like i don't know i it's also something that we like to complain about you know um and i at the end of the day like i don't know everyone's still excited for e3 totally (laughs) totally well and i you know in doing in reading about e3 for in preparation for this episode it's like E3 has almost died before. Yeah. Like uh yeah. in you know like in the like 2007 2008 I think it was. They um in like 2006 they the show had kind of gotten out of hand or at least a lot of the presenters this tells you how different the world is now than it was in 2006. But they there were too many like bloggers and not enough like and all they wanted at the show all the people uh the presenters wanted the show really was like retail and journalists which they considered like yeah. print media or like tv news and so they were like this is too many people and so they tried to like shrink the show to just those people and uh it basically almost killed e3 and it wasn't until they opened it up again that uh to just like more industry and like letting bloggers in and stuff um that it kind of came back so my hope is you know like e3 in some form can't survive or this the uh, uh, joy that we all get from E3 can continue to exist, even if E3 itself doesn't in the future. Yeah, I, t- I, t- I totally agree with that. Um, my last E3 memory is from E3 2017. And this is the first E3 that Patrick, you and I covered on this show. Yeah. Uh, we had just started this podcast a few months earlier. And so it is very memorable to me for that reason. It is also very memorable to me because it was the show that revealed uh, Super Mario Odyssey in all of its glory, and it had Jump Up, Jump up Superstar, Superstar, baby! Which is, uh, again, like, uh, it's, so f- it's funny that your last one was Super Mario Galaxy 2, and it was tied to the music, yeah. because the reveal of Jump Up Superstar, it really was the reveal of Super Mario Odyssey set to the tune of Jump Up Superstar. Yeah. And uh, well, so I, j- just a, a quick like uh, ad- adjustment here. This isn't technically the reveal. We had seen Super Mario uh, Odyssey earlier during the the January Switch. That's right. We had seen the teaser where like Mario, but he didn't throw his hat he or anything his, of that. Well, right, right. It wasn't until the very end that we got a hint at Cappy, and we saw the like New Donk City. Right, and it was like, what is going on? But this was the reveal where it was like, hey, this game is called Super Mario Odyssey. Yep. Here's kind of what the deal is. You're throwing hats, and, you're possessing people, <laughs> and there's a this awesome jazz song yeah it's the big blowout yeah. and it has this jazz song super, uh jump up superstar and at first i na- now i cannot imagine jump up superstar not existing right uh it's such a great song the way that it is uh implemented in the game is euphoric but i remember at the time being just like this is so crazy like this is so weird like being very excited for it but just being like, what is this? This is so new and different. Yeah. Um, just to have like this song in a Mario game. And uh, that is what I love about E3. That is what I love about Nintendo. That is what I love about doing this show is uh, just these moments of like still being able to be surprised by Nintendo and um, still them, you know, just being able to uh, make me happy. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, you were over here that morning so we could watch the, the, the presentation. You brought donuts. 
Um, we were recording uh, afterwards during the treehouse when they revealed um, the Samus Returns. That's right, because this that because twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. No, it was 2017. Yeah. 2017 was also the year that they showed off Metroid Prime or announced Metroid Prime 4. Right. With uh, just the logo. With just the logo. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a banger E3 for Nintendo anyways, but man, yeah, that was so much fun. <sighs> okay. Those are our favorite E3 memories. What are some of yours? Uh, I guess you can email them to us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. Gmail. But next week is E3. We're going to be coming at you on, uh, Tuesday morning with our reactions to the first three days of uh, news that may relate to Nintendo, but not quite the Nintendo presentation yet. And then, uh, you know, on Tuesday, at some point in the day, we are going to be releasing an episode uh, reacting to Nintendo's presentation and uh, the Treehouse stuff that follows. Um, so, look, we're all E3 all the time, baby. It's That was all this week and all next week. Yeah, and if you have E3 memories, yeah, definitely send them to us because yeah. maybe we'll incorporate them in that first show yeah. on tuesday look w do we really have an idea of what the the first of these two shows is going to look like no no we don't even know what e3 is no one does this year so uh we'll, but we'll all figure it out together um all right mark let's close this out Okay, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts. If you like the episode, episode, please share it with your friends on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you share stuff. <laughs> Stumble over one word and the whole sentence falls apart. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Nincart Society. We also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers saying thank you for listening. Hey, it's Mia. Hey, it's Allie. And we host the Rom-Com Review Podcast, P.S. I Love Rom-Com. Each week, we'll have incredible guests come and discuss a new rom-com, grand gestures, meet cutes, and of course, that elusive chemistry. Mia, what are you doing holding that giant boombox over your head? I'm hoping to win over listeners with this grand gesture. Take us back! Find a new episode every week and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Brought to you by Campfire Media. Wow, you're uh, still holding that boombox. Yeah, I've got great upper body strength. Thanks, CrossFit. Yes, I love rom coms. I love rom coms. Campfire. <laughs>